Digital Foundry is sponsored by Backedface, the leader in crash and error reporting for game developers. Click on the link in the video description and sign up for your free trial today. Buying a new TV, it's not something you tend to do as much as, say, upgrading your smartphone. Typically, you keep your screen for five years or even more. But I'd say that now is a really good time to be upgrading, definitely if you're still using a 1080p display. Now, PlayStation 4 Pro, Xbox One X, they led the way, but the game has moved on. PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X are specifically designed for 4K gaming, and the arrival of the new HDMI 2.1 specification brings with it new features that will allow you to get much more out of these new machines. So, new hardware, new display features, better gaming. So this this is the LG 75 Nano 99, a frankly gigantic 75 inch screen that ticks most of the boxes required to get the most out of next gen consoles and of course high end PC. So LG provided this nano cell screen for a few reasons. First of all, you may remember from the RTX 3090 review that with all of the talk about gaming at 8K resolution, I couldn't really pass judgment on that until I'd actually gamed on an 8K screen. And well, 7,680 by 4,320. 33.2 million pixels. That's what this display has. Think of that as four 4K panels in a 2x2 two two configuration presented as one gigantic single screen. It's just literally immense. Okay. So 8K testing, we'll be taking a look at this using this supreme high-end ASUS version of the RTX 3090. But what is NanoCell? LG is rightly famous for its OLED panels. NanoCell is its alternative technology aimed at a different market and approaching this in an objective manner is difficult because Look, I've had an OLED screen since 2016 and here at Digital Foundry we've been raving about OLED in the years since. Nothing has changed. Of the five DF team members, four of us have OLED screens all bought with our own money. The latest LG CX or C10 OLED, yeah, it's the best consumer level TV on the market, no question. And the 48 inch version of that handily doubles up as the best PC monitor money can buy, in my opinion anyway. So. What does NanoCell bring to the table? Well, generally, NanoCell is a very different technology aimed at a more mainstream, price-conscious market. The display type itself is based on an IPS panel, meaning, you know, pretty good viewing angles right off the bat. But a particle layer is added to absorb unwanted light wavelengths, increasing the purity of red and green elements in an RGB pixel. So the pitch from LG is, bright, vibrant colors, plus a good degree of latitude in where you sit in relation to the screen. Something that's a bit of a problem with competing VA screens, which tend to focus more on richer contrast, but have narrower viewing angles. Truth is, in the mainstream market, there are many different options with their own plus and minus points. So yeah, do your homework and preferably get to see the new screen you're interested uh, in action, if you can. So. The economics of LED screens in general, and NanoCell in particular, open up some interesting options, which leads us on to the second reason to look at this type of screen. It is a cheaper technology than OLED, and a NanoCell screen can be half the price. In actual fact, it's actually more like a quarter of the price when it comes to 8K actually, but in the 4K space, you have an interesting choice. A smaller OLED screen or a larger LED display for much the same money. If I have one regret when buying my OLED B6 back in 2016, it's that 55 inches sounds huge on paper, but the pixel density at 4K is pretty high. So its effectiveness is diminished in living room conditions uh, where you're viewing from range. And if I have one takeaway from testing this 75 inch monster in my living room, it's that size really does matter, especially in gaming. A bigger screen means more immersive gaming, a better visual return from 4K, and it's absolutely essential at 8K. I have no problem whatsoever in telling the difference between 1080p and 4K here, in terms of how that size differential actually pans out. Well, here's some uh, library footage of me testing the RTX 3080 
or my OLED B6. Now here's how much bigger a 75 inch screen is sitting on the same media cabinet. Almost overwhelming actually. This screen is longer on its diagonal than I am tall and I'm six feet tall. So yeah, wow. So two screen types at two price points and some interesting choices. Pro points for OLED, infinite contrast, absolute blacks, every pixel capable of its own degree of individual brightness. Minus points, peak brightness isn't especially high and there's always gonna be a concern about burning. Nano cell plus and minus points. Well, bigger is indeed better and you get a bigger screen for the money. There's zero chance of burning and something I noticed with this top end Nano 99, which may not apply to other products in the Nano cell stack. It's really bright, which may work out better in a room with a lot of ambient light. Minus points. Contrast has been raised as an issue on some nano cell screens. But it's actually pretty good here on the Nano 99, which is the top of the range. HDR, make sure you choose a screen with full array local dimming. That means that the screen is divided into individually lit zones. And typically the more zones, the better. I can see the variations in brightness on this one, but I didn't feel that short changed. Nano 99 does get LG's top-end local dimming solution, mind you. Things that the two display types have in common. Well, I'm still of the belief that LG's WebOS is the best front end on the market. No need for repeated button clicking. The so-called Magic Remote still calls to mind the Wii Remote. It's still the most intuitive interface. There's also commonality in the chipsets used for image processing. Though be careful to check which one you're getting. Nano 99 here is the best LG IPS based screen and it gets the top end Alpha 9 image processor, the same as the C10. Deployed here for a bunch of tasks, including AI upscaling. But do bear in mind that you can't use that in game mode. So let's talk about something really crucial here, HDMI 2.1, which offers a huge leap in bandwidth for the interface. So HDMI 2.0 on my old B6 no slouch, 4K at 60 frames per second, 8.3 million pixels per frame updated 60 times per second with HDR overhead on top of that. HDMI 2.1 at a minimum doubles that, opening the door to 4K gaming at 120 frames per second. It's a key feature that you do get with nano cell screens as well as OLED and I'm quite surprised at how many launch games are tapping into 120 hertz. Ori and the Will of the Wisps on Xbox Series X is probably the best showcase on any console. Full 4K at 120 frames per second and it's flawless. As is The Tourist here. A simpler kind of game but still very striking visually and beautifully smooth at 4K 120. But what's surprising me is how much support there is. Other games like Dirt 5 and Call of Duty Cold War and the huge Call of Duty Warzone are tapping into 120 hertz offering lower latency and faster visual response. Another interesting feature is ALLM, which is basically a protocol that allows your games console or PC graphics card to tell your display to auto-tune its settings for low latency gameplay. And that starts off by kicking in game mode. On LG screens, this seems to be flagged up as LG instant game response. And you know when it's working as you'll get this prompt in the top right. For me, this worked great on both Xbox and Nvidia RTX products, but unfortunately right now it didn't work at all for Sony PlayStation 5. Next up, for me, one of the most game-changing HDMI 2.1 features, variable refresh rate. Right now, it's only supported on Xbox, but Sony has talked about it in the past, and I really, really hope to see it added to PlayStation 5 as soon as possible. So without VRR, your TV updates 60, or possibly 120 times per second. But it updates at a fixed rate, meaning that when your console or PC GPU readies a new frame, it needs to synchronize with the TV to give smooth gaming. But what if the frame is late? What if it can't do that? Recently, we looked at Assassin's Creed Valhalla, which aims for 60 frames per second on both PS5 and Xbox Series X, but often doesn't hit the target. You can see what's happening here in the performance analysis. The game can't synchronize with the screen. It sends out a new frame when it's good and ready. But this is while the screen is refreshing. And that's what causes screen tear. 
The alternative is that the game's machine, the console, keeps hold of the frame and waits for the next screen refresh. The problem there, obvious stutter. VRR is the solution to this and here's how Assassin's Creed looks with VRR active. You'll see with the data screen in the top left there, that rather than adopt a fixed refresh rate on the display, it's updating when the console tells it to. The result is no tearing, just a smooth response. I consider this one of the most important HDMI 2.1 features. And again, it can be found in some existing HDMI 2.0 screens, but 2.1 codifies it, makes it official. Microsoft has partnered with LG for optimal performance here, something I can verify as during the Xbox preview period, I received beta firmware updates with tuned performance. Officially, the partnership is with OLED displays, but firmware improvements extend to NanoCell too. In fact, some LG NanoCell and OLED displays appear to use the same firmware download. A quick aside here, you might have noticed that the camera shots there didn't come from the Nano 99. Ironically, the 8K NanoCell screen is one of the few, possibly the only one, that doesn't support VRR right now. But the majority of 4K NanoCell screens do, and hopefully this one will get an update. Uh, oh yes, and of course, so does the LG C10, which is the screen we used to show the VRR effect here. But obviously what the Nano 99 can do is 8K resolution. And that's where we're going to bring in my Core i9-10900K test PC for some initial 8K testing. So 8K, kind of fascinating because really games simply aren't designed for it. And looking at what this extreme gaming combination delivers, my overall impression in looking at 8K gaming in the flesh is almost like you're sampling extreme anti-aliasing. I started with Ori and the Will of the Wisps because if you're at 6K60, super sampled down to 4K on Xbox Series X, RTX 3090 should easily deliver native 8K60. And on the balanced setting, it kind of does. Though maxing things out kills frame rate, bringing you down into the 30s. And while high settings are off the table, I could actually super sample down from what I think was actually 9.2K and still mostly hit 60 frames per second on the balanced setting. Problem is that really, you do hit some weird limitations and there is some slowdown. So a beautiful experience overall, but given the wealth of options HDMI 2.1 gives me, I think I'd be looking to leverage 120 Hertz instead. I also gave Watch Dogs Legion a go, a game that is highly demanding and that I did not expect to get much joy from at all at 8K. And this is where you're gonna be needing to tap into AI upscaling via Nvidia's DLSS if you want to be using the game's signature ray tracing modes. So I went with DLSS performance mode here, which is AI upscaling from 4K. And even with Alex's optimized settings, I couldn't lock to 30 frames per second. I could use Nvidia's DLSS ultra performance mode, which uses AI to upscale from 1440p instead. And here achieving 30 FPS locks with everything ramped up to the max was not a problem for the majority of play. There are still some drops to performance though. It seems that using 8K encoding for capture here may have a performance implication of its own. The game's playable enough, but especially with AI upscaling, I'm not entirely sure what the benefit is over native 4K. Again, in living room conditions and sitting at a distance, but not too far away, I think I'd sooner opt for more temporal resolution, a higher frame rate. So overall then, early days in the 8K space, and I'd really like to try more titles. But again, right now, gut feeling is that high frame rate at 4K resolution is much more of a win. So obviously it's still early days for 8K in general, and I think the idea of native rendering at that resolution will be very limited. AI upscaling like DLSS is going to be key if this display format ever really takes off. But in the here and now, it is cool that the screens exist, that there are options, and that more of the HDMI 2.1 spec points can be ticked off. And of course, now I can test 8K gaming, which I will be doing in more depth when time allows. And yeah, I'd certainly like to see if Cyberpunk is at all possible on that. Okay, so let's wrap up. Key takeaways, first of all, a 55 inch 4K display has kind of become the default, but really not getting a bigger screen. It's the only regret I ever had with the OLED B6 I bought back in 2016. Going larger, much larger, really does pay off if you have the room to house it. 
you'll just get more from a 4K presentation. One thing you'll note here is that the 75 inch nano cell just barely fits on my IKEA Bester cabinet and only just slots in beneath the top cabinet there. Unpacking and installing this, well, I was a bit worried. Bottom line though, premium technologies like OLED do typically command much higher prices than LED alternatives like NanoCell. And yeah, that quality is undeniable, but for some, size will have a bigger impact. So what's the second takeaway? 2016 was a turning point for 4K and a good time to upgrade. And now in 2020, HDMI 2.1 features like 120 Hertz and VRR are being standardized. Just need Sony to embrace VRR as fully as Microsoft has done, and it'll be game on. Finally, ALLM, or Instant Game Response, as LG calls it. Well, that just ensures your screen is in optimal condition for low latency response, key to games actually feeling good to play. So that's all from me for now, but we'll be seeing this screen again whenever we really want to push things with 8K, and it'll be interesting to see if the format gains traction as this generation progresses. It might sound insane, but then again, I said similar things about 4K when I first checked that out with PC hardware way back in 2013. And well, here we are. So that's it. That's the video. Please like, subscribe and share if you enjoyed it and ring the bell for instant notifications whenever DF posts new content. And of course, our Patreon is there for those who want to see our content in the best possible light via pristine quality video downloads. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching. Don't lose players to game errors and crashes. Instability will happen throughout the game development cycle during playtesting, beta cycles or after you've released. Backtrace was developed to automate the capture and analysis of crashes, hangs and non-fatal errors across PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo, PC, Mac, Stadia and more. Our unique data platform allows you to index anything, integrate with Jira, Slack, Discord and run analytic workloads to better prioritise and understand your game's stability. Many of the industry's AAA studios depend on Backtrace. You should too. Click on the link in the video description and sign up for your free trial today.